Join us as we explore the enigmatic and riveting tale of the Knights Templar. Explore the origins of this legendary order, tracing their humble beginnings as protectors of pilgrims in the Holy Land to their meteoric rise as one of the most powerful and wealthy organizations in medieval Europe. The Knights Templar, an enigmatic order of warrior monks, have captured the imaginations of countless generations. They were revered as holy defenders of Christendom, feared as formidable fighters on the battlefield, and whispered about as guardians of hidden treasures and ancient mysteries. Emerging from the shadows of the Crusades to become a force that shaped the destiny of kingdoms and stir intrigue for centuries, their rise was meteoric, ascending from humble beginnings to unrivaled wealth and power. Yet, their fall was equally swift. Today, we're uncovering the stories that have left an indelible mark on history. We'll navigate through the treacherous waters of their persecution and dissolution, revealing a chapter in history that still raises questions and stirs imaginations. The true story of the Knights Templar is a complex and fascinating tapestry of faith, power, betrayal, and intrigue. Their meteoric rise and tragic fall serve as a stark reminder of the fleeting nature of earthly power and the enduring allure of mystery and legend. This is the story of the Knights Templar. This is the Dark History Project. Please like and subscribe to know when new episodes are available. Now, let's get started. As we dive into the story of the Knights Templar, we should first learn what the times were like back then and what was going on geopolitically. This will help us better understand what led to the creation of the Knights Templar. The 11th century was a tumultuous era marked by profound shifts in the political, religious, and cultural landscapes of Europe and the Middle East. At its heart was the First Crusade, a monumental event that began in 1096. It was a response to centuries of religious conflict and expansionist ambition. The Catholic Church, led by Pope Urban II, called on Christians to recapture Jerusalem from Muslim control. This appeal set off a wave of fervent religious zeal, attracting knights, nobles, and commoners alike. The First Crusade's success in 1099 led to the establishment of Christian states in the Holy Land and left an indelible mark on the history of the medieval world. Now, years before the First Crusade, the Seljuk Empire, culturally Turco-Persian, started moving into Constantinople, and the emperor of the Byzantine at the time asked the pope for support. Since they had no army, he called the Christian people to help. The pope at the time announced a few things, or benefits that attracted many people from all backgrounds, and not just people with military experience to join the Crusades. The pope was actually giving every Christian a sense of purpose to defend the Holy Land. In those times, the Catholic Church was everything to most people in Europe, and serving the Church and fighting for their beliefs granted them a divine purpose. Pope Urban II said that whoever would go and defend the Holy Land would gain a few things. Number one, Christians needed to defend the Holy Land and defend Christianity. Number two, you would get to take any loot or treasure captured from the enemies. Number three, you would get a ticket to heaven automatically if you died in the effort. So, people saw this as a win-win. Now, that's why it's important to understand what was going on back then. To Europeans, serving the Pope or serving the purpose of Christianity and salvation was the ultimate goal. Also, it wasn't just common people who joined the effort. At the time, several European kingdoms were fighting each other for territory and goods. Now, the brilliance of the Pope here was that he spoke and met with some of the nobles of Europe and told them, hey, instead of fighting each other, do it in Jerusalem for Christianity. Now, the kingdoms of Europe were not dumb. They knew that if they fought for the Holy Land, they would get to control the ports where the Silk Road started from the west. This was a huge economic advantage to have back then. They would control the flow of goods of the largest known trade route. So, they joined the cause as well. 
The First Crusade had ignited a fervent wave of Christian pilgrims journeying to the Holy Land, attempting to reclaim Jerusalem from Islamic rule. However, this newfound Christian presence in the East led to a pressing need for security, protection, and organization. It was against this backdrop of uncertainty that the Knights Templar came into existence. In the year 1119, a group of nine knights, led by Hugh de Paines, banded together in Jerusalem to form a religious and military order. Their primary mission was to safeguard the dangerous roads leading to the holy sites, ensuring the safety of Christian pilgrims who braved the treacherous journey to Jerusalem. To carry out this sacred duty, the knights adopted a unique blend of monastic life and military prowess. They took monastic vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, living a life of asceticism, much like the monks of their time. At the same time, they honed their combat skills to perfection, transforming themselves into formidable warriors who could defend the faithful from the dangers of the Holy Land. Their efforts didn't go unnoticed. The Knights Templar quickly gained the support of the Catholic Church, receiving papal endorsement and generous donations from the noble families across Europe. With this backing, the order expanded rapidly, establishing a network of fortified castles and financial infrastructure that enabled them to amass vast wealth. Over the years, the Templars became a symbol of both religious devotion and military prowess. Their distinctive white mantles adorned with a red cross marked them as the vanguard of Christianity in the East. They not only protected pilgrims, but also engaged in battle, earning a fearsome reputation on the battlefield. The creation of the Knights Templar was a response to the Catholic times they lived in, and the rise to prominence was a testament to the dedication and effectiveness in fulfilling their mission. This unique blend of spirituality and martial prowess made them a legendary force in the medieval world, ultimately shaping the course of history. The Templars distinguished themselves in several key battles, showcasing their martial skills and unwavering commitment to the cause. One of their most notable achievements was their role in the Battle of Montgizard in 1177. Facing a vastly outnumbered Christian army against Salah ad-Din's forces, the Templars provided unwavering support and tactical expertise. They formed the vanguard, leading a daring charge that exploited the enemy's disarray. Their disciplined and fearless charge broke through Salah ad-Din's lines, creating chaos within the Muslim ranks. This crucial assault led by the Templars allowed Baldwin IV and his forces to capitalize on the confusion, ultimately securing an improbable victory. The Templars' courage and strategic prowess were instrumental in preserving Jerusalem from imminent peril. Another pivotal moment came at the Battle of Haddon in 1187. Led by Grand Master Gerard de Reinfort, the Templars joined King Guy of Jerusalem's forces in confronting the formidable Muslim army commanded by Saladin. However, due to a lack of unity and tactical errors, the Christian army suffered a devastating defeat. Many Templars were captured, and their losses severely weakened the Crusaders' presence in the Holy Land. The fall of Jerusalem to Saladin shortly after the battle marked a turning point in the Crusades. The Battle of Haddon stands as a tragic chapter in the Templars' history and the broader Crusader endeavor. The Templars' military successes garnered them significant political influence. They formed close alliances with European monarchs and nobility who supported the Crusader cause. Kings, queens, and nobles often provided the Templars with financial and logistical support, reinforcing their military capabilities. One of the most notable patrons was King Richard the Lionheart of England, who sought their assistance during his campaigns in the Holy Land. The Templars' ability to navigate the complex politics of the time, forging alliances and securing resources, made them a force to be reckoned with. One of the biggest things the Templars were known for was how they practiced banking. This is a pretty debated subject among historians, since similar banking practices were done by other cultures. 
pilgrims journeying to the Holy Land face the risk of robbery and theft, prompting the Templars to devise a secure system. They issued letters of credit to pilgrims, allowing them to deposit their assets at one Templar commandery and receive a document enabling them to withdraw equivalent funds at another location. This early form of banking reduced the risks associated with transporting wealth across long and perilous journeys. Again, similar practices were already in place by others, but the networks they developed across Europe and the Middle East helped them be known for banking. Now, the way these notes worked was by using encryption to secure them. To ensure the security and authenticity of their notes, the Knights Templar employed advanced encryption practices for their financial transactions. They used secret codes and symbols, often incorporating religious and mystical elements, making it extremely difficult for counterfeiters to replicate their notes. These encryption techniques were a testament to the Templars' commitment to safeguarding their clients' wealth and their reputation for trustworthiness in financial matters. Now, if you deposited gold coins in one place and withdrew them in another Knights Templar institution, they would look at your note, decipher it, and know how much money to give you. It was brilliant and innovative at the time. The Templars' financial services extended beyond safekeeping to lending and investment. They accumulated vast wealth through these activities, which contributed to their influence and power. Their financial acumen attracted the support of monarchs and nobles who sought their banking services. In the early 14th century, King Philip IV of France, colluding with Pope Clement V, targeted the Templars. They were arrested on a Friday, October 13, 1307, and charged with heresy, blasphemy, and corruption. Eventually, they were executed. This is the ultimate blow that took down the Templar, but there is much more to the story. The decline of the Templars began with their military setbacks in the Holy Land. The catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Hattin in 1187 weakened the Christian hold on Jerusalem. Over the years, their inability to regain lost territories in the face of Saladin's forces eroded their military prestige. Soon after is where King Philip IV of France planned to take down the Templars. Philip was deeply in debt due to his lavish spending, wars he was funding, and the ongoing conflict with England. He borrowed massive amounts from the Templars and other religious institutions. As the Templars had become one of the most powerful organizations and financial institutions in Europe, Philip saw an opportunity not to just take them down, but to eliminate his debts and seize the assets of the Templars, which included land, castles, and their treasuries. Philip also had some issues with Pope Boniface VIII. They clashed on issues of taxation, as well as the influence the Pope had in Europe. Philip gained some influence with the Pope's successor, Pope Clement V, and pressured him into cooperation with taking down the Templars. On that infamous Friday of October the 13th, 1307, King Philip IV of France ordered the mass arrest of Templar knights throughout France, marking the beginning of the Templar downfall. Pope Clement V, heavily influenced by Philip, was complicit in the operation as he sought to assert papal authority over the powerful order. The Templar Knights, who had been entrusted with guarding key Christian interests in the Holy Land during the Crusades, were taken completely by surprise. They were simultaneously apprehended in their preceptories, arrested and imprisoned. After their arrest, the Templars faced a harrowing ordeal. They were imprisoned across France and subjected to intense interrogations and torture, as King Philip sought to extract confessions to fabricated charges. These coerced confessions played a pivotal role in justifying the crackdown on the order. King Philip used the written confessions, which happened under torture, to show the world the crimes committed by the Templars. Some of the crimes included worshipping the devil, spitting on the cross, communicating with evil entities, and a bunch of ludicrous accusations. Now, keep in mind that the idea for torture at this time were the same practices held during the Inquisition. So when I say torture, I mean the Inquisition type of torture. 
The Templars were then put through both ecclesiastical and secular trials, which were deeply flawed. Many were found guilty and faced various fates, including imprisonment for life or execution, often by burning at the stake. King Philip seized the Templars' vast wealth and assets, substantially enriching his coffers and stabilizing his finances. The Templars' downfall became a significant financial windfall for the French crown. One of the most fascinating stories about the fall of the Templars is the execution of the 23rd and last Grand Master of the Knights Templar, Jacques de Molay, who led the order sometime between April 20th, 1292, until it was dissolved by order of Pope Clement V in 1312. The execution of Jacques de Molay is a poignant and historically significant moment. In March 1314, the actual day is debated, de Molay and Geoffrey de Charny, another high-ranking Templar, were brought to a scaffold on the Ile Ougif in the River Seine in Paris. Facing their impending deaths by burning at the stake, Jacques de Molay and Geoffrey de Charny demonstrated extraordinary courage. As the flames rose around them, de Molay reportedly uttered a curse, prophesying the deaths of Pope Clement V and King Philip IV within a year. His words sent shockwaves throughout the medieval world. According to accounts, de Molay reportedly uttered a curse, prophesying the deaths of Pope Clement V and King Philip IV within a year. His words sent shockwaves throughout the medieval world. According to accounts, de Molay's alleged words to the Pope and King Philip IV were, Pope Clement, Chevalier Guillaume de Nogaret, King Philip, before one year, I summon you to the tribunal of heaven. Cursed, cursed you will be. Fire will consume your flesh, and worms will devour your souls. The curse seemed to have a chilling effect on those who witnessed it. And indeed, both Clement V and King Philip IV died within a year of de Molay's execution. While some historians question the authenticity of these reported words, they have become a legendary part of the Templar narrative, adding to the mystique surrounding their downfall. Jacques de Molay's steadfastness in the face of death and his prophetic words have left an indelible mark on the history and legacy of the Knights Templar, perpetuating their enigmatic and enduring story through the ages. Some Templars managed to evade capture and persecution by fleeing to other regions, where they continued their traditions and influence. In Portugal, for instance, they were reconstituted as the Order of Christ. Pope Clement V officially dissolved the Templar Order in 1312, marking the end of a once mighty institution that had played a pivotal role in the Crusades and medieval European history. The last interesting thing in the story of the Templars is that the Chenon Parchment, a crucial historical document, played a pivotal role in the posthumous exoneration of the Knights Templar. Issued by Pope Clement V in 1308, it revealed that many Templars had confessed under duress during trials. The Pope absolved them of heresy and granted forgiveness, allowing them to reconcile with the Church. Although the Chinot parchment came too late for Jacques de Molay and other Templar leaders executed in 1314, it did provide a degree of vindication for the order. This act of forgiveness marked a belated acknowledgement of the unjust persecution and torture that had led to their downfall. The alleged treasures of the Knights Templar have long been the stuff of legends and conspiracy theories. While King Philip IV of France managed to seize a significant portion of the Templars' wealth and assets, there have been persistent claims that a substantial portion of their supposed hidden treasures remained elusive. Jacques de Molay, the last Grand Master of the Templars, steadfastly refused to reveal the whereabouts of their supposed hidden wealth, even under the threat of torture and execution. It is said that when de Molay was arrested in 1307, he maintained the order's secrets, leading to the enduring mystery surrounding the Templar treasure. 
Legends and theories abound regarding Templar treasures hidden in various locations, including the famous Oak Island Money Pit, Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland, and beneath the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. However, these claims lack concrete evidence. The secrecy surrounding the Templars, coupled with their international reach and extensive financial network, has fueled speculations that they may have hidden their wealth in remote locations or entrusted it to secret allies. While some Templar assets were absorbed by other medieval orders or seized by the church, the notion of hidden Templar treasures continues to captivate treasure hunters, historians, and enthusiasts alike, perpetuating the enduring enigma of the Knights Templar. Thank you for being with us for this episode of the Dark History Project. Please help us out by sharing, subscribing, or liking this episode. If the platform you are listening to allows for comments, please let us know what you think. We're available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and every other podcast platform. We hope you enjoyed it. And our next episode will come out soon, where we'll talk about the 1947 Roswell UFO crash. See you then. <laughs>